afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to our Founding Fathers, a parade of decades of styles and textiles in celebration of our town's 250th anniversary. Our display includes original and replica fashions from the Northboro Historical Society's collection. Some of the fashions were also patiently crafted over the last year by the Society's 250th Anniversary Sewing Circle, who thoroughly enjoyed their labors and the laughter and friendship we shared. Modeling the garments will be Society members, current residents, and others portraying past residents who may have worn such styles during our long fashion history. For example, I stand before you today boldly and proudly as Miriam Wheelock Ager, the widow of James Ager Sr. James and I were quite well off before he died in 1761, leaving me a young widow with eight children. Still, I was able to live comfortably and peacefully here for many years until the Revolutionary Era. I'm proud to say the Agers were one of North Bro's founding families. In fact, my husband's father donated the land on which the town's first meeting house was built, near where the Unitarian Church now stands. Nevertheless, I was branded a hostile resident of the town <laughs> and the country in 1778 due to the loyalist leanings of several members of the Ager family. Because of these loyalties to the crown, we were labeled, and I quote, inimical to the town and the United States of America. <laughs> Two of these loathed loyalists were my sons, James and John, who were eventually stripped of their estates here by the colonial authorities. They absconded to Nova Scotia, where they lived out their lives. Fortunately, I was allowed to keep my estate here. Politics was very dangerous in those days. So this afternoon, you will see the fashions and hear about the lives of several other residents of our town throughout the years. As you know by our anniversary year number, Northboro was incorporated in 1766 after separating from Westboro as its North District. Residents of the North Sector were tired of making the long journey into Westboro to attend church services and with the few and far between visits of the town's pastor to the North District. And so they decided to go off on their own. So what were our founding fathers wearing at this time? A basic of men's clothing was the knee length undershirt. It was tucked into a pair of breeches and could be slept in as well. It could also be tucked between the legs in diaper-like fashion to form undershorts of sorts, since such underwear was generally not worn then. <laughs> Waistcoats or vests, long jackets and stockings, completed a man's suit. Long, narrow pieces of linen, called cravats, were wrapped about the neck and tied in front. The cocked or tricorn hat turned up on one, two, or three sides and was the most popular headgear for men. Thank you, sir. <laughs> An essential foundation of women's dress was the stay. This was a boned undergarment worn to support posture 
and by this era to fit the bosom. And we have a couple of stays displayed over there. Gowns were mostly open at the skirt front and worn with a separate petticoat that showed in the front and could be changed for a new look or for more warmth in the winter. The stomacher was a triangular piece of separate material used in certain styles to close the bodice front of the gown. These could be attached with pins and laces and so forth. Some stomachers were stiff, some were soft. Hoops or bum rolls were used to give the skirt volume. I actually am wearing a bum roll. <laughs> Hats were a must, including the familiar white mob cap that helped to keep hair free of dust and eliminated the need for daily hairdressing. Flat crown straw hats adorned with ribbons or flowers were popular as well. A woman's shift was an undergarment worn with informal or working clothes. It was topped with a vest and a skirt and were often worn as nightgowns as well. You will see several of these styles today. For example, this dress that I made in our anniversary sewing circle is very much like a woman of our town's early days would have worn for a social occasion. Because it is made of cotton, it most likely would not have been a ball gown or other formal event. It would have been perfect, however, for attending a tea or a card party in the afternoon. I didn't make it in the authentic open skirt style, I made it as a one piece. I cheated. But this insert would have been a separate petticoat and this would have been the stomacher. But let's get on with the show. I believe I see one of the town's first prominent citizens back there waiting to greet us. It's the Reverend John Martin and his wife Mary Merritt Martin also known as Dick and Cindy Atwood. <laughs> Reverend Martin was our town's first minister and was ordained in the first parish church in 1746, now known as the Unitarian Church. The church, as well, you know, was a very important part of life in the early days of the colonies, and there was only one in each town. So that made the minister of that church a very significant person in the town. Even so, this reverend didn't always have designs on that prestigious position. His first ambition after graduating from Harvard College in 1724 was to capture the heart of Mary Merritt. And despite her father's disapproval of the union, he managed to do just that. Apparently, Mr. Merritt, who did business with Harvard College, was aware of John Martin's dubious reputation at the school due to his habit of going against the rules and amassing fines that amounted to one-third of his tuition. Merritt also believed his 19-year-old daughter was too young to marry. But despite Daddy's objections, love prevailed and the young couple eloped to tie the knot in Concord at the home of one of her aunts. Over time, they became the parents of five children. Before coming, <laughs> before coming to Northborough, John built a successful career in the town of Harvard. As he matured, however, religion came calling, and he prepared himself for the ministry. At the somewhat advanced age of 39, he applied for and was awarded the position of first town minister in Northborough. But as noted earlier, John had a mind of his own, and his sermons often ruffled the feathers of his staid parishioners. Whether for this reason or for lack of church funds, John sometimes had trouble collecting his salary. In 1750, he wrote a long letter of complaint about the issue to the precinct leaders and signed it from your suffering pastor. <laughs> this fixed the problem for a while, but three years later he had to lodge another complaint about his lack of wages. Though he was a controversial clergyman, John remained minister to his flock for 21 years and died of a so-called nerve fever 
1767. Mary died eight years later in 1775. Today, we see Cindy Atwood dressed as Mary in what might have been her Sunday go-to-meeting outfit. Made by Cindy in our sewing circle, the cotton garment's main features are the voluminous panniers, part of the skirt looped up and draped around the hips. A bum roll or hoop along with petticoats were traditionally worn underneath. Elbow length sleeves with self ruffles are also typical of the era. Lace and ribbon trim the square neckline and sleeves. The lace cap, also made by Cindy, tops off her ensemble. Reverend Martin is heading for services with his black clerical gown on his arm. He is wearing a typical tricorn hat, brocade waistcoat, and breeches. His white shirt flaunts lace-trimmed cravat and sleeves. His entire outfit, typical of the era, was made by Cindy Atwood. Thank you very much, Reverend and Mrs. Martin. Marching in now is one of Northboro's first military leaders, Minuteman Captain Samuel Wood II and his wife, Susanna. Samuel came to town as a young man when his father built a textile fulling operation near the Assabet River. Upon the death of his father, he became head of the family business. He also served as an assessor, district clerk, and selectman. In the spring of 1775, as the revolutionary movement was heating up, Samuel was appointed captain of the newly formed militia company of 50 Minutemen. They immediately began to drill on a plot of ground at the corner of Church and Pleasant Streets. Thus, in April of that famous year, they were ready for action as word came of the trouble at Lexington and Concord. Upon hearing the news, they promptly assembled at Captain Wood's home to head off to Boston, accompanied by the sound of fife and drum. Upon arrival there, the Northboro men and other militia companies surrounded the British, and Captain Wood was slightly wounded at the Battle of Bunker Hill. He remained in the Army during the war and again attained the rank of captain. After the war, he returned to Northboro and his family business. Whether it was all his activities that kept him single or not, Wood did not marry until the age of 48, when he wed 40-year-old Susanna Fife of Bolton. <laughs> Susanna was one of 12 children of James Fife, a Scottish immigrant who had bought a farm in Bolton. Samuel and Susanna had just one child, born in 1795, when her mother was 44 years old. Unfortunately for the Woods, their daughter lived only seven months. She is buried near her parents in Howard Cemetery here in town. The Woods' home is still standing at the corner of Route 20 and River Street and is where our models, Brian and Lois Smith, now reside. The Woods have dressed themselves in Revolutionary Era costumes. Susanna is wearing the traditional split front skirt with changeable petticoat underneath. Lois made her dress of luxurious rose silk with a burgundy silk petticoat. She is wearing the charming flat crown straw hat and undercap so popular in that day. The captain is arrayed in cotton canvas breeches and a linen waistcoat, also made by Lois. The vest is fastened with antique buttons from the town's 19th century Proctor Button Factory. He carries the typical canteen and haversack of a minute man. Thank you very much, Captain and Mrs. Wood. Not long after the demise of John Martin, 
the town hired as its second minister, Reverend <coughs> Peter Whitney, a young Harvard graduate who was just 23 years old when he took up his duties here. The following year, Peter married Julia Lambert of Reading. And here comes the happy couple now. <laughs> Reverend Whitney, a staunch patriot, was well liked by most of his flock and was not afraid to pe preach independence from the crown. Some of his writings were published, including the first history of Worcester County and a eulogy for George Washington. Julia was also admired by the townsfolk. In his history of Northborough, Dr. Allen writes that Madam Whitney possessed dignity of manners, sprightliness of mind, and goodness of heart, and was a most pleasant companion and valuable friend. <laughs> the revered couple lived in the parsonage on Whitney Street and raised 11 children. According to tradition, <laughs> According to tradition, this lively brood was lined up in order of age and marched off to church on Sunday mornings. In fact, the family was so large that Reverend Whitney had to buy a second pew in the church to accommodate them all. In those days, families paid for their own pews, although the minister did get one free one. But all was not bliss for the Whitneys. Disaster struck the family one Sunday morning in April, 1780, while Reverend Whitney was preaching. Word came that the parsonage was on fire, but not to be deterred from God's work, the Reverend put the alarming note aside and finished his sermon. Fortunately, the good townsfolk rallied around them, contributing to their needs and building a new parsonage on the site of the old. That building now stands at 62 Whitney Street and is the home of Rick and Marie Niebuhr. Peter Whitney served the town for nearly 50 years before passing away suddenly in 1816 at the age of 71. And Julia died five years later. Today, we see society members Frank and Judy Bissett as Reverend and Mrs. Whitney dressed for Sunday services. He has donned his black robe and traditional minister's white stock and wig and carries an antique Bible from our collection. Mrs. Whitney's cotton-striped two-piece dress laces at the bodice and has the traditional split-front overskirt with eyelet cotton petticoat underneath. Her fetching bonnet matches this outfit made for the town's 200th anniversary celebration in 1976 and donated afterwards to the society. And thank you so much, Reverend and Mrs. Whitney. And now we will meet the indomitable Deacon Livermore and his apparently equally indomitable second wife, Jane Dunlap. <laughs> the deacon came here from Watertown in 1727 and married Abigail Ball of the pioneering Ball Hill family. They built a home there, which still exists today at 500 Green Street. Said to be a very learned man for his time, he was a founding member of the town's first church and was named a deacon in 1746. He is said also to have held just about every possible town office over his long life here. He died in 1801 at the age of 100 years and seven months. The hardy deacon is said to have ridden his horse into town and back on his 100th birthday to attend a military muster. Though he was a church deacon for nearly 40 years, he was buried without church ceremony because of a long-standing dispute with the Reverend Whitney, whom he had shunned for several years. Well, now for the juicy part. 
Mr. Livermore's first wife died in 1775 after 52 years of marriage. Not one to waste time, the 75-year-old deacon took a second wife five months later, Miss Jane Dunlap of Milton. But it would appear from Kent's history that it was not a blissful union. <laughs> Records show that the second Mrs. Livermore wrote letters to church officials demanding that the good offices of the church be withheld from the deacon until such time as he treated her as a Christian man ought to treat his wife. <laughs> Not sure just what that meant or who regretted the vows more. But Jane endured the marriage until death did them part. Here we see Jane Livermore, also known as Tricia Benedict, garbed in a replica printed cotton daytime dress, typical of the 1775 period. Notice the pleated Watteau panel at the back, a frequently seen element of the time. It is named for the artist Watteau, whose paintings of women of the period often featured these flowing panels adorning the backs of their elegant gowns. Under the panniers of her skirt, she wears a bum roll, which is padding tied around the waist to create ample curves at the hips. The fashion, <laughs> the fashion thinking here was that these voluptuous hips made a woman's waist look smaller. Well, I guess oversized hips weren't a concern back then. <laughs> Completing her costume is a cotton mob cap. Joe Benedict, as the misbehaving Deacon Livermore, is, is, is wearing a farmer's traditional outfit, the linen jacket made by Ellen Racine, our curator, Overshirt, white trousers, and leggings were practical garb for the hard-working men of the day. His straw hat kept the sun off while toiling in the fields with his antique hay fork. Thank you very much, Deacon Livermore and Mrs. Livermore. Now we will see the third and last of our town paid ministers, the Reverend Joseph Allen and his devoted wife, Lucy Clark Allen. Reverend Allen was hired in 1816 when he was 26 years old and served as town minister until 1832 in that year. A, oh, in that year, a second church opened in town and the custom of the town hiring and supporting its own minister came to an end. From then on, clergymen hi were hired by the individual churches. The Reverend Allen then became known as the Unitarian Church Minister and held that position until 1873, the year of his death. The Allens were a very busy and social couple. Besides writing three sermons a week and overseeing his parish duties, Reverend Allen and Mrs. Allen also ran a boarding school for boys ages 7 to 15 in their home from 1834 to 1844. At times, there were nearly 20 students under their hectic roof, in addition to their own brood. The large yellow house built for the pastor and his family in 1817 still stands across Church Street from the Unitarian Church. Reverend Allen also served on the town school committee for 50 years. He was also an avid botanist who was said to be responsible for the planting of many lovely shade trees along Main Street. He also wrote a history of Northborough. Meanwhile, the indefatigable Lucy was raising their seven children, tending to the daily care and feeding of the boarding school students and keeping up with the many social duties of a minister's wife. There were constant guests in the house, and she made calls and attended myriad teas with other women of the parish. In the evenings at home, she often entertained the students with music on her guitar, played parlor games, read to them, 
and also taught them French. It was often a rowdy household, as Lucy recounts in one of her journal entries, and I quote, is it possible that this has been a Sunday? Nothing but going to meeting twice has at all reminded me of it being a holy day. Such noise and confusion. The great boys talking at the very top of their voices and walking around the house like any other day, not thinking of taking a book, and the little boys racing and scampering and hollering both out of doors and in. Well, it was lucky for the good reverend he happened to be off on another parish visit on this rowdy day. <laughs> Lucy was truly a working woman of her day. Today, Alexandra Molnar, as Lucy, is wearing an authentic ecru wool jacket bodice, printed silk skirt dating to the mid-1800s. It appears from examining the jacket that it may have been the bodice of an earlier outfit. It was common for women at the time to get the most out of their clothing by recycling tops and skirts, and even cutting up the full skirts to make a whole new garment. As a struggling minister's wife, Lucy might have done just that to her own clothes. And Lucy's bonnet is an original 1800s style from our collection. Reverend Allen, portrayed by our society president, Mark Bashore, is wearing a black wool serge frock coat, a gentleman staple of the 19th century, with a black stock at the neck. Both stock, suit, and his velvet offering sack are from our collection. Feel free to give the poor minister a penny or two. <laughs> Thank you very much, Reverend and Mrs. <laughs> We now introduce Dr. Stephen Ball and his wife, Lydia, an easily recognized couple around town. The second of his family to carry that title, Dr. Ball was born in 1767 and practiced medicine for more than 50 years in towns ranging from Framingham to Northborough to Leicester. Dr. Ball is described as a quiet fellow who never seemed happy. A, a very colorful figure, he could be spotted around town in his noisy yellow gig, wearing a yellow fur hat in winter. It is said you could smell his gig in the dark before seeing it, as, its pungent, odors, as pungent odors emanated from his medicine bag. <laughs> Despite his dour personality, Dr. Ball had a fairly profitable practice with an income of $1,000 a year. And that isn't bad considering he charged 25 cents for an office visit. Still a bachelor at the age of 32, Stephen one day cast his eye on 19-year-old Lydia Lincoln. He spied her walking along the street and then entering a house. He made an excuse to visit the home and there encountered his soon bride-to-be. They married in 1800, had 13 children, and, re and remained together for 50 years until Stephen died in 1850. It seems Lydia was well cared for by her physician husband who bought her what is said to be the first piano in town. And that instrument is now owned by the Historical Society and is on display upstairs in our museum. Another of Lydia's claims to fame was the large umbrella. This is not quite as large as that. <laughs> she sported about town. It was termed a portable penthouse by some, and it annoyed many citizens and she was sometimes told to shut that thing down because it spooked the horses. <laughs> Today, Linda Corbin, as Lydia, carrying an original parasol and wearing a gauzy embroidered gown, 
that is one of the earliest in our collection. Said to be the 1805 wedding gown of Mary Crawford, the style could have served the same purpose for Lydia, who married just a few years before that. Its low-cut neckline, short empire bodice, and wispy fabric are typical of the era that saw dramatic changes in women's styles between 1790 and 1810. Due to democratic and republican political movements, this free-flowing Grecian silhouette took hold in Europe and America for both day and evening wear. It emphasized the natural figure and for a brief time freed women from tightly laced corsets. <laughs> During the era, it became socially acceptable to, dare I say, Lydia, bare her bosom for evening dress <laughs> events according to fashion records of the day. These dresses were often accessorized with shawls, gloves, and armlets. Lydia's delicate shawl belonged to Hannah Babcock, who lived from 1751 to 1857. Dr. Ball, Lydia's well-to-do husband, Norm Corbin, well, Linda's well-to-do husband, Norm Corbin, <laughs> is decked out in a green cutaway jacket with pleated tails, white vest, and neck stock. His regalia is completed by a top hat and doctor's bag. These are all part of our collection. Thank you so much, Mr. and Mrs. Bond. Why? Here comes Captain Cyrus Gale, a very distinguished town father. Cyrus was born in 1785 and came to Northborough as a young man who made a prosperous life here for himself and his family, some of whom you will meet in a moment. Gale earned his captain's title as a member of the local militia but mainly he was a very visible businessman in the town center. Beginning in 1813, he operated the general store, which was a gathering and shopping spot for his fellow townsmen for 50 plus years. That notable building with its identifying tall columns still stands across from the current library and houses several apartments. Besides being a successful merchant and director of the Northborough Bank, he served in several town offices and on the Governor's Council. He was a founder of the Gale Fund for the Poor and in 1866 donated $1,000 to help start the Northborough Free Library, now known as the Gale Library. Captain Gale lived to the ripe old age of 95, perhaps due to the tender loving care of his three wives <laughs> who join him here today. Mar the young woman in white lace and blue satin empire gown, why don't you come over here, reminiscent of the early 1810-1820 period is the first Mrs. Gale, Eliza Davis, portrayed by Susan Atwood Bessem. Her dress, made by her mother, Cindy Atwood, is much trimmer than its predecessors of the 1700s and was a look much favored by Dolly Madison. The style featured a low-cut, short empire bodice sewn to a very simple skirt with any gathers at the rear. Trimmings were sparse, like the small sash on Susan's dress long gloves, kerchiefs, and stoles usually accessorize this style. Married in 1816, she and the captain had three children. Frederick William perished at sea with his wife and young daughter when returning from a trip to Italy. Their daughter, Anna Davis Gale, married an attorney, George Barnes. Sadly, Cyrus Jr., the third child, born in 1821, lived only three months. Poor Eliza died the next day at the age of 26. <laughs> and mother and son are buried together. 
two years later, Sarah Patrick, a Worcester girl, became the second Mrs. Gale. Today, Rebecca Atwood, as Sarah, wears a charming style from the 1830s. The diagonal cut raised bodice, often pleated, was a signature feature of this romantic style, as were the billowy full sleeves and dropped shoulders. This intricately designed dress was crafted by Ellen Racine, the, our museum curator and the driving member of our sewing circle. Sarah's period bonnet was created by her mother, Cindy Atwood. During their 23 years together, Sarah bore the captain five more children, including another Cyrus Jr. who inherited his father's penchant for philanthropy. The second Mrs. Gale died in 1849 at the age of 55. So, so, three years later, at the age of 67, Captain Gale took a third wife, 54-year-old widow Susan Grout Holbrook, portrayed here by Allison Pierce Peake. Susan was a capable businesswoman who, at age 25, inherited her father's store in Westboro and his real estate. She retained sole ownership of these properties throughout her life. In fact, when she married Cyrus, he signed a prenuptial agreement, ag agreeing to that status. So I guess prenups aren't such a modern convention after all. Susan's crisp linen costume is an original from our collection and dates to the 1860s. It features a suave jacket separate overskirt, black soutache braid trim, and wide pagoda sleeves with detachable undersleeves, elements popular during the Civil War period. In fact, a nearly identical style appears in an 1865 painting by Claude Monet. The short, open front suave jacket is based on uniform jackets originally worn by French army soldiers and later adopted by some Civil War units. Ladies' skirts reached their fullest volume in the 1860s and were worn with wide hoops, as witnessed by Allison today and by the classic movie Gone with the Wind. On her head, Allison is wearing an original lace cap from our collection. Despite the fate of her predecessors, Cyrus's third wife, managed to outlive him. <laughs> Dying at the ripe old age of 89 in 1887, Paul DeRosier, as Captain Gale, is wearing an authentic 19th century linen paletot from our collection. The coat originally, originally belonged to Caleb Chapin, owner of the former Chapin Woolen Mill, and once the town's largest industrialist. The paletot is a close fitting overcoat resembling a frock coat and was so popular around 1840 to 1870 that a French fashion magazine lamented, paletots, yet more paletots, more paletots still. They have become more fashionable for, fashionable for every class, for every hour of the day for every occasion. It was meant to be worn over a suit or other ensemble. Captain Gale's is an informal style for everyday summer wear. His outfit is topped off with a straw boater, the classic men's summer headgear from the 1880s to the 1940s. And we thank you all very much, lovely ladies and spouse. Here, we have another distinguished Northboro couple, Jairus and Mary Lincoln. 
Mr. Lincoln, a graduate of Harvard College, was a teacher and staunch advocate of emancipation of the slaves. A musician as well, he compiled several books of songs opposing that scourge before coming to live here from Hingham in 1844. The Northboro Historical Society has one of those songbooks in its collection. The Lincolns settled on Rutland Road Hill at the curve on Pleasant Street, where there is now a housing development. Mr. Lincoln soon became politically active in town, tirelessly agitating for the emancipation of the slaves. He also gave singing lessons and established a boarding school in his home on the hill. He launched the town's first high school in 1858. The high school lasted just 10 weeks as the town declined to fund it again. <laughs> However, Jairus and his wife Mary managed to maintain a similar version of the high school from 1859 to 1860. Here we see Mary, known also as Valerie Pierce Daigle, in a purple striped silk day dress with a billowy skirt, full cuffed sleeves, and neatly buttoned tight bodice, typical of the 1860s. Bodices were tightly boned and often came in twos, one for the day wear and a dressier one for evening. Again, hoops were a must. This replica dress is another of curator Ellen Racine's creations. Her bonnet is an original from our museum. Society member Neil Cronin, a retired Algonquin Regional High School teacher and a singer himself, is dressed as his fellow teacher might have been in the mid-1800s in a skirted black double-breasted frock coat with matching black shawl-collared vest. His top hat was standard headgear for men after the demise of the tricorn hat around the end of the 18th century. Perhaps the most famous top hat patron was Abraham Lincoln, whose top hat was a towering stove-type version. According to a history of men's hats, the top hat was worn for all occasions, formal and informal, through much of the 19th century. In fact, up until the eight, 1863, the bobbies of the London police force wore top hats as part of their uniforms. Thank you very much, Mr. Lincoln. Here, we have another pair of noted Northborough educators, Elmer, Elmer and Rebecca Crawford Valentine. Married in 1831, the working couple operated a long-running boarding and day school in a building on Rebecca's family farm on Cherry Street, later known as the Valentine Farm. As a youngster, Mr. Valentine was educated at the Reverend Allen's home school, which was previously mentioned, and then went on to Framingham Academy. His entire career was devoted to teaching at which he was well respected. One of his methods, which I'm sure the students appreciated, was to discipline with a sense of humor rather than physical punishment. No switches in his school, I guess. While many traditional academic subjects were taught at the Valentine School, among the best known skills practiced there was a style of penmanship that was less ornate than most in use at the time. In a paper presented to the Historical Society in 1914, Edith Valentine recalled the school averaged about 25 students, but sometimes as many as 40. Rebecca Valentine, the mother of 12 herself, <laughs> also acted as mother to the boarding students. Rebecca is said to have had a good sense of humor, which it sounds like she needed, and a cheerful disposition. She's also described as an unselfish Christian woman, gentle but self-reliant. <laughs> On Sundays, this good Christian woman, 
her husband, and all the children attended two services at the Baptist church. Many walked while a few rode with Elmer and Rebecca. Between services, she would open a wooden chest in her carriage and serve gingerbread and apples for lunch. Their eighth daughter, Ellen, continued to run the school for several years after her father's death. Today, we see Rebecca in a green checked silk dress from our collection. It has a black gathered inset panel at the front, slim cut sleeves with slight puff at the shoulders, and a fitted elongated waistline. Notice the, braiding, the braided tie adorned with knots at the waist and on the detachable lace collar at the neckline. These were all popular trimmings from the late 1880s or early 1890s. Her outfit is topped off with a beautiful embroidered vintage silk shawl. Rebecca is portrayed today by society member Melanie McGee. Her original black bonnet is trimmed in green velvet and crystal ornaments. Society president Mark Bashour portrays Mr. Valentine in a black frock coat, white brocade vest, and string tie. The finely tailored coat was said to have belonged to Henry Colburn in the 1880s and was donated to the society by his great-granddaughter, Elizabeth Hilliard, whom we will hear more about a bit later. He wears a bowler hat from the museum's collection. The sturdy style was created in England in 1849 and remained popular throughout the 1800s and the first half of the 1900s. It was worn by just about every man, from politicians to actors to every fellow on the street. Thank you so much, Mr. and Mrs. Valentine. Next, we will see three of Northborough's prosperous citizens in elegant at-home wear, a gentleman's smoking robe and ladies' wrappers. Both became popular in the mid-18th century. A London gentleman's magazine in 1850 described the smoking jacket as a short robe made of velvet, wool, and similar fabrics. After dining, a gentleman would retire to the den or smoking room and don his ja smoking robe or jacket. The garment would protect his clothing from smoke odors and burn holes from falling ash. The jacket remained a popular accessory into the 20th century. To quote a newspaper article in 1908, it would be putting it mildly to say that a new house coat or smoking robe will give any man reason for elation. <laughs> this swanky silk garment worn by Dick Atwood may date to the 1920s and was owned by Herman Sparrow. He is wearing a replica smoking cap to keep the tobacco odor out of his hair. Sparrow was a successful dairy farmer in town and a selectman from 1960 to 1969. He and his herd moved to Vermont when his land was sold to make way for Interstate 290, a flood control project and industrial park in the northeast end of town. Accompanying Mr. Sparrow are two ladies in their mid-1800s era wrappers. A ladies fashion and etiquette magazine published in 1860 describes the wrapper as a suitable dress for breakfast. These garments fit the figure loosely <laughs> and were made of simple fabrics like chintz, gingham, muslin, and the like, except for winter wraps. They often featured a belt to shape the tent-like dress. They could also be left unbuttoned from the waist down and worn with a white skirt or petticoat that poked out through the opening. Additionally, wrappers were an early form of maternity clothing as they could be worn without corsets and had room for expansion. <laughs> but 
This word of caution appeared in a fashion magazine of the day. A lady should never receive her morning callers in a wrapper unless they call at an unusually early hour. A wrapper made with a handsome trimming open over a pretty white skirt may be worn with propriety, but the simple dress worn for breakfast or in the exercise of domestic duties is not suitable for the parlor when receiving visits of ceremony in the morning. Our white cotton wrapper worn by Susan Bessem once draped the figure of the very fashionable Ellen Chapin, wife of mill owner Ezra Chapin. The pink cotton wrapper seen on Stephanie Pierce Conway belonged to Lydia Augusta Menser Valentine. Both garments are said to have been part of Ellen's and Lydia's wedding trousseaus when they were married in the mid-1860s. Note the painstakingly hand-sewn applique trim on each dress. It's amazing workmanship. And we thank you all. <laughs> well, speak of the devil. Gracing us with her presence now is that very same Ellen Chapin, one of Northboro's grandest dames of the 19th century. Thanks to her prosperous husband, Ezra Chapin. Ezra was among the town's most successful industrialists. The couple married in Charlestown and came to Northboro in 1864. Along with his father, Caleb Chapin, Ezra ran the Chapin Woolen Mill on Upper Hudson Street in the section of town that came to be known as Chapinville. Besides the mill, the Chapins owned housing for mill workers, which still exists today on Chapin Court, and a company store. Eventually, a post office was established in the neighborhood as well to serve the Chapin workers. Meanwhile, Ellen lived in grand style in the three-story mansion the couple built on Hudson Street in 1891 for $85,000. It boasted a sweeping ballroom for entertaining on the upper floor. The elegant mansion replaced their previous home, which was heavily damaged when a steam boiler exploded in it. Other evidence of their affluent lifestyle was Ezra's pant penchant for racing his prized horses and the fact that he was the first person in town to buy an automobile. The couple had one adopted daughter, Jenny, who graduated from Northboro High School in 1885 before setting off on a grand European tour with her friends. Jenny later married and produced the Chapin's only grandchild, Ezra, named after his grandfather. Not much is known about Ellen, but she is said to have been a very religious woman <laughs> with her affluent and who enjoyed her affluent life. Our collection includes Mrs. Chapin's silk wedding dress, shoes, and Paris made petticoat. We also have a dapper little Lord Fauntleroy velvet suit worn by their grandson, Ezra. Ellen Racine, as Ellen Chapin, has arrayed herself today in another of her own silk creations. It is reminiscent of the 1870s when silk fabrics and neat small prints became popular. A draped apron-like overskirt often topped a slimmer underskirt. The overskirt was pulled up in the back to form a bustle. The cuirass bodice also made its entrance at this time. It was hip length, tightly fitted and boned, much like a piece of armor, <laughs> had a high neck and straight sleeves. Her bonnet is an original 19th century piece from our collection. Ernie Racine, as Mr. Chapin, is wearing a black wool serge three-piece suit, 
The short jacket has a small lapel collar with cutaway front and is fastened with four covered buttons. The matching short vest has six covered buttons, a small collar, and points at the waist. As the owner of the first automobile in town, <laughs> Ezra is sporting an authentic linen duster, a coverall worn by those in early open motor cars to protect their clothing from road dust. Thank you so much, Mr. and Mrs. Chairman. Entering now are Milo and Frances Hildreth, a prosperous and prominent 19th century Northboro couple. Milo, who made his fortune in comb and shell jewelry manufacturing, married Frances Hooker of North Brookfield in 1846. As is typical of the era, not much is known about Frances, who we can assume was kept quite busy bearing and caring for her seven children, while also running an affluent household and hosting business meetings and gatherings for her industrious husband. No doubt, the large brood filled the fashionable three-story house in which they lived, across from the present town hall building on Main Street. We know that Milo was born in Townsend and at 17 became an apprentice comb maker. But Milo had other ambitions, namely the medical profession. So he entered Townsend Academy to pursue his studies. To help pay for them, he did some teaching and also plied his comb making trade. Then in 1847, he was offered a partnership in a comb business so out went the medical ambitions. His industrial career was sealed. In 1859, Milo and two brothers bought an old cotton mill on Lower Hudson Street for their new business. Unfortunately, that shop burned the next year, so the business moved to a building at the corner of Main and River Streets on the site now marked by Stone's Cycle Shop. The factory was once again destroyed by fire, but Milo built a more impressive one on the same site. The business, like several others in town at the time, created fine tortoise shell jewelry, combs, and other accessories. Millions of Northboro made combs were sold around the world. As testimony to the quality of the Hildreth goods, the company won several design awards at the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Milo and Francis are being portrayed by Judy and Frank Bissett. She is wearing a figure skimming Victorian era three piece dress in shades of blue cotton that she made in our society's sewing group. The cutaway coat is fastened with four buttons and a chain in the front and crisscross ribbons at the back. It is worn over a bustier of different fabric. The gathered skirt is pleated at the bottom. White lace trims the neck of the coat. Her parasol is a museum orig original. And we'll wait to see if she can get it up. OK. There it goes. A beautiful museum original. Milo's blue brocade vest with shawl collar was also made by Judy. Yes. His walking stick and derby hat are from our collections. Thank you very much, Milo and Judy. Next, we meet Miss Ellen Williams, a refined and learned woman by all accounts, along with her friend and housemate, Mrs. Annie Fairbanks. Ellen was born about 1839 and grew up in one of the town's oldest homes, the Holloway Maney House on Church Street. Her grandfather and then her father raised prized cattle on the property. As a young woman, this is Ellen, migrated to Syracuse, New York, where she became a teacher in what was called then the State School for the Feeble-Minded. 
It was probably there that she met the unfortunate Annie Fairbanks. Annie grew up in Syracuse, and in 1861, at the age of 17, married a sea captain, George Fairbanks, who was 17 years her senior. Tragically, George was lost at sea the following year when his ship, the Yorkshire, was wrecked. No trace of him was ever found. George and Annie had one child who sadly also died very young. Eventually, Ellen returned to Northborough and took up residence in the family manse. In 1898, she sold that farm and bought the historic house at the corner of Church and Pleasant Streets. That house was originally built as the Evangelical Congregational Church in 1832. She is listed there in 1910 as having her own income, a woman of independent means, obviously. After her death, Annie donated Ellen's collection of Oriental art objects to the Worcester Art Museum. Her family also owned a painting by the renowned artist Gilbert Stewart. Miss Williams was a founder of the Northboro Historical Society and a library trustee for 30 years. In 1885, she created the first card catalog at the library, making it much easier to update the listings every year. The effort took her three years. In his history of Northboro, Reverend Kent terms Ellen a reader of the best literature and her literary judgment was very keen. Of the companionship between Ellen and Annie, Reverend Kent wrote, for many years, the friendship of these two women has been very beautiful and will long remain one of the precious traditions of this town. Ellen died in 1917 and Annie followed three years later in 1920. Today we see Ellen in a lovely late Edwardian period dress in lavender silk from our collection and dating to about 1910. High collars were still in fashion and this one is boned to keep it tight and upright. Ouch! <laughs> Waistlines are higher, returning to the empire line of the early 1800s and a straighter silhouette worn with longer hip-length corsets. This would be the last era, by the way, in which women were encased in tight corsets for everyday life. <laughs> the bloused bodice is called a pigeon front, a holdover from the earlier period when women's bodies were forced into S shapes by corsets and bustles. <laughs> Ellen is portrayed by Beth Finch McCarthy. Melanie McGee, as Annie, is wearing an original black satin era two-piece dress, 1890s era two-piece dress. By that time, skirts were less voluminous, falling smoothly over the hips into a wide flare at the hem. This one is also edged in lovely black antique lace. The draped leg of mutton sleeves end in a tight cuff at the wrist. Both ladies wear hats from our collection. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the late 1800s, women were escaping their traditional domestic duties. Little by little, many began working in offices and other less typically female labors. This newfound freedom also extended to sporting activities. For example, in the 1860s, ladies began taking up tennis, along with bathing, archery, golf, and cycling. These leisure enjoyments mushroomed in as the century wore on, and along with their growth came the need for special clothing. Joining us now are two young cousins, Colleen Daigle and Delaney Conway, in authentic bathing and, dennis, and tennis costumes, from the late 1880s and early 1900s. The bathing dress is in the typical navy blue color and made of scratchy wool. 
ouch, and underpinned with bloomers, black stockings, bathing shoes, and a hair covering were also required. Needless to say, women didn't really swim in these cumbersome outfits. <laughs> they did allow them, however, to dunk and frolic in the waves. At least that was some relief from the heat. Our, our white tennis outfit is typical of a later fashion trend in that sport. Initially in the mid-century, women players wore long, heavy wool bustle skirts. They were bound up also in corsets, high-collared blouses, and neckties. That fashion changed, however, when Maud Watson won the Wimbledon Ladies Lawn Tennis Championship in 1884. Watson, the first woman Wimbledon champion, wore a long white bustled two-piece dress at that competition. Women soon realized that white was the best color for tennis clothes because it didn't reveal sweat stains as much as other colors. Thus, tennis whites have dominated the tennis, fast tennis fashion scene ever since. Along with white hues came lighter white fabrics, such as linen and muslin. Our charming tennis suit consists of a blouse, skirt, and sleeveless bolero jacket. A skimmer hat completed this more, authentic, more comfortable ensemble. And all of these, mostly all of these, the dresses and the shoes and one hat, the straw hat, are from our collection. The tennis racket belongs to someone in our uh, society. Thank you. And the hat was made by Colleen's grandmother. <laughs> Next, we have a sister act, Emma Louise Proctor and her sister, Fanny Ethel Proctor. As a single business career woman, Emma Proctor was a rarity in the 19th century. But she was also an example of the changing role of women as the century drew to a close. With the invention of the typewriter and telephone, more and more women turned to clerical jobs to make a living. Emma was born in 1868 and Fanny in 1870. They were two of nine children of Josiah and Lizzie Proctor. Their father was a partner in the button and comb manufacturing operation, Whitaker and Proctor. The business, which sold its products all over the world, was located in what is now the home of Sawyer's Bowling Alley across the street from here. Emma and Fanny graduated from Northboro High School together in 1885. It appears Emma began working in the button and comb factory office three years later. Then, in 1892, Josiah Proctor died at the age of 52 after a long struggle with the effects of his Civil War injuries. That's when Emma's life took a major turn. She and her mother took over operation of the business, with Emma handling office and bookkeeping duties. She was just 24 with the help of longtime employee Frank Gates as operations manager, the Proctor woman, women ran the business until it closed in 1908. By then, changing fashions and the introduction of cheaper raw materials took a toll on the fancy comb industry. So after 20 years of working in the family business, Emma found herself unemployed at the age of 44. According to one record, she soon was working in the office of Alan C. Jocelyn's Slipper Factory in Oxford. Emma died in 1937 at the age of 69. Sister Fanny also remained unmarried and became a revered school teacher in town. The Proctor School on Jefferson Road is named in her honor. After graduating from Framingham Normal School, Fanny taught in Northboro for 40 years. 
Her career began in the one-room North School on Whitney Street and ended in the now-demolished Hudson Street School in 1930, where she was principal as well as a teacher. Besides her teaching duties, Annie seemed to have led a full and fun social life. One of her activities was the O. Quet Club, a women's only group that some of her male friends called, humorously we hope, the Old Maids Croquet Club. <laughs> Besides hosting croquet matches, one of the club's event was a bow knot party, meaning no men allowed. Fanny was also a library trustee and secretary of the Northboro Teachers Association. In 1911, Frances Harrington, school committee chairman, wrote of Fanny, she has always been and still is quite popular with her pupils and their parents, and it would be considered a decided loss in our teaching force to have her leave our schools. But leave she did after four decades of enlightening Northboro children. Fanny died at the age of 90 in 1960. Emma's no frills, no lace, linen day suit, worn by Valerie Pierce Daigle, was a firmly established style by the 1900s for office work, traveling and leisure activities such as walking. They were worn with tailored blouses called shirtwaists. While women favored these practical costumes for the workplace, some men objected to the suits as they saw them as representing a challenge to their masculine authority. <laughs> this suit, as were many of our items today, was donated to the society by the Margaret Sherman estate. Emma's hat is an original from our collection and is typical of styles from the early 1900s. Her sister Fanny, portrayed by Zenia Molnar, wears the skirt and blouse ensemble that was wildly popular for office workers and school teachers in the 1890s. The gay 90s bodice became an icon of that era with its high collar and distinctive leg of mutton sleeves. The skirts were constructed with gores and darts for a trimmer fit over the hips with all the fullness falling from the center back. The blouses ranged from simple shirt styles to frillier models, all pin-tucked and lacy down the front. A whole new look could be created for the working girl by changing the blouse. Thank you very much, sisters. <laughs> Joining us next are Samuel and Amy Barnes Maynard, another learned and distinguished couple of the 19th century Northboro. In 1878, Amy was one of the first three students to earn a diploma from Northboro High School. She went on to study at the Boston Women's Institute, which later became the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She then taught school for several years in various locations around the country. Eventually, Amy married Samuel Maynard, a Northboro native and a professor of botany and horticulture at the Massachusetts Agricultural College in Amherst, now known as the University of Massachusetts. Samuel also wrote several books in his field of expertise. In 1902, they retired to Northboro, where they bought the lovely colonial home and 40 acres at what is now numbered 130 South Street. Despite her domestic responsibilities as the mother of three children, Amy always kept busy in civic affairs. She founded the Amherst Women's Club in Northboro, and in Northboro was a member of several organizations, including the Historical Society. During World War I, she chaired the Northboro Women's War Relief Committee, which provided many items for wounded soldiers. During World War II, she worked again on relief causes and urged establishment of a worldwide organization to promote peace. That goal soon came about 
with the creation of the United Nations. And 100 years ago this year, Amy held the suffrage flag on the women's suffrage float <laughs> in the town's 150th anniversary parade. When Samuel died in 1923, 64-year-old Amy turned her hand to innkeeping. She opened her South Street home and gardens to summer guests, calling it the homestead. In an advertisement for the accommodations, we read that Northboro Air is considered fine for those needing rest or recuperation. <laughs> the ad describes the property as a comfortable country home with ample piazza and summer house, elm-shaded lawn and garden with 40 acres of, full of hill and meadow set with fine trees and shrubbery. The cost for this Eden-like setting was $12 to $15 a week for room and boy. Here we see retired Northboro librarian Jean Langley as Amy in an original 20 style evening dress of midnight blue, velvet and lace, trimmed with fine beading on the cuffs and belt. Perhaps Amy wore a similar costume to a banquet for one of her many town activities or as hostess for a special dinner at her guest house. This era saw a big change from the floor-length corseted styles of previous decades. Note the dropped waist, flatter bosom, and shorter skirt <laughs> of this rather shapeless style so popular in the 1920s. Her husband, Samuel, introduced earlier as Paul DeRocher, is wearing a vintage white dinner jacket with black vest and tie. Completing his classy look is a white Panama hat from our collection. The jacket is said to have been worn to many Harvard College reunions or graduations by its former owner, Edwin Proctor, who was a French teacher at the private Choate School and counted John F. Kennedy among his students. Proctor also donated 75 acres of land to the town of Northboro for open space. And we thank the Maynards so much for appearing with us today. And now, last but not least, we meet one of Northboro's most memorable denizens of the 20th century, Elizabeth Hilliard. Some of those who knew Elizabeth have shared here a few of their recollections of the notable woman. Born in 1899, the only child and prodigy of Philip and Jenny Morse Hilliard, Elizabeth graduated from North Pro High School in 1917 as salutatorian. She then went on to graduate magna cum laude from Smith College, followed by further study at Columbia University. Elizabeth then taught history at Attleboro High School for 28 years. She eventually headed back to her hometown to become the director of the Northboro Library for 11 years, retiring in 1964. She was also active in several organizations, including the Northboro Historical Society. The Hilliard family lived for many years in one of the large vintage houses on Whitney Street, directly behind the Unitarian Church. It was from that site that she witnessed the terrible fire that destroyed the, the historic Unitarian Church on December 22, 1945. As noted earlier, Miss Hilliard, as she seems to have been called by all those who remember her, had some unforgettable traits. Society member Paul DeRocha of the family-owned WCD Garage recalls her pulling in for gas in her 1958 Chevy. She would tell Paul exactly how much gas the car would take and the pump always stopped right where she said it would. <laughs> she also knew precisely how much the total would be. Northboro native Jane Fletcher recalls that same car 
having wooden planks for floorboards in the back seat. <laughs> the original floor having rotted out by then. I think Paul's father used to help her keep that car together, Jane said. Both Jane and Carolyn Squillante, who also grew up in town, remember that Miss Hilliard always wore very elaborate hats adorned, adorned with birds, flowers, and other ornaments. Jane remembers that high school students of her era enjoyed watching the librarian make change out of the little purse she kept in a pocket on her petticoat. <laughs> Lifting her skirt a bit to get at the money. <laughs> Although we always giggled at her funny ways, it was really a pleasure to have known her, Jane added. Miss Hilliard is clad today in what might have been a typical dress in the 1930s. The summer princess line frock of printed voil features a capelet and mid-calf hemline. As Miss Hilliard, Arlene Marshall, a former president of the Historical Society, is also sporting a signature flamboyant hat a style so dear to Miss Hilliard, her trusty change purse is still attached to her petticoat. <laughs> well, the memorable Miss Hilliard wraps up our fashion stroll through Northborough's history. <laughs> we, had, we had great fun planning it and presenting it to you all and hope you enjoyed it as much. Please stay and enjoy our delicious goodies and then head up to the museum if you like. But now, before you step away, we would first want to thank our glamorous models and invite them to come forward for one more round of applause. Thank <laughs> you.